the passage we chanted just now. What's the Buddha's analysis of the path? And it forms the framework for all of his teachings. It was the first topic he mentioned in his first sermon, and the last topic he mentioned in his last. When he was speaking to Sabada, the wanderer, Sabada had asked him, you know, is it only in the Buddhist teachings that there are awakened people, or do other teachings have awakened people as well? And at first the Buddha put the question aside, just said, put that aside, I'll teach you the Dharma. But then he went on to say that it's only in teachings where there are the Eight Factors of the Noble Path taught that you're going to find awakened people. And then he finally gets to the point that it's only in his teaching that has that teaching. So when he put the question aside, it was a matter of etiquette. This is the way. And we like to hear there are lots of different ways, lots of different paths up the mountain that all get to the top. But if you've ever been on a mountain, you know that not all the trails lead there. Some of them wander off someplace else. And so the Buddha, having been to the top, comes back and says, okay, this is the only way up there. You want to give his words some credence. In fact, he says that one of the signs of someone who has actually attained the first level of awakening is that they realize there is no other path. This is it. So look at the factors. You have right view, right resolve. These come under the heading of discernment. It's right speech, right action, right livelihood. These come under the heading of virtue. And then right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These are all under the heading of concentration. And it's important in each case to remember that each of these factors is part of a path. It's meant to go someplace. So the purpose is strategic. It's not like we practice the path for the sake of arriving at right view. We use right view as a factor in the path to take ourselves to release or to arrive at release, because a lot of ourselves is going to get left as unnecessary baggage along the way. So right view starts with conviction in the principle of action, that your actions really are important, and they do make a difference, that by acting on skillful intentions, you're going to meet with pleasant results. If you act on unskillful intentions, you're going to be with unpleasant results. The Buddha has to start here because there are a lot of teachings in his time which denied the role of action. Some said that action was actually illusory, and others said, well, there may be actions, but it doesn't really have any effect on anything. And others said that whatever you do is already predetermined, so you really have no choice. If you're looking for a path of practice that leads to the end of suffering, you can't adopt any of those ideas, because it would make the whole idea of a path meaningless, the whole idea that any effort you could make would become meaningless. So the Buddha never proved that things weren't determined by the past, but he said, if you really want to put in an effort to put an end to suffering. You've got to accept the idea that your actions really do have consequences. And as we said the other day, some people like the idea of determinism. It lets them off the hook, as long as they're doing relatively well. But when they're suffering, if you gave them the choice, would you have the, like the choice not to suffer? And they would probably say yes. At that point, they would like to have the power of choice. I think it's not just the power of choice. You have to have the skills that go along with it. That's what the rest of the path is about. You're developing these skills. First with right resolve. 
realizing that unskillful actions are going to cause trouble. You resolve not to get tied up in sensuality, in ill will, and in harmfulness, because you know these things are going to get take you down the wrong path, take you down the path to suffering. And then you look at your actual actions. This is a right speech, right action, a right livelihood come in. To what extent do your words and your deeds and your livelihood actually cause harm to other people? To what extent do they cause harm to yourself? And the Buddha has you use this reflection as a way of developing honesty. For him, the prime virtue is the virtue of truthfulness. And if you can't admit to yourself that the things you say are causing harm, or the things you do are causing harm, or the way you gain your livelihood is causing harm, there are going to be huge blind spots in your mind. So this forces the quality of honesty on you. If you want to follow the path, if you want to get to the end of suffering, you have to look very honestly at how you're living your life. Make changes in cases where you're causing trouble. All these factors working together make it easier to meditate. Notice that effort and mindfulness and concentration all come under that heading of concentration. The Buddha never talked about mindfulness as one kind of practice and concentration as something else. I was reading someone saying one time, well, these are two different factors in the path, therefore they must be very different. Otherwise the Buddha, would have, Buddha wouldn't have singled them out as being different factors. The problem is that people make them so different that they become antithetical. Sometimes they define mindfulness as an open, accepting, non-reactive state of mind, whereas concentration is narrow and willful. And it's hard to see how the two could go together. In fact, sometimes they actually say the practice of right mindfulness on the one hand and right effort, right concentration on the other hand are two separate paths. As you can see, that's not how the Buddha taught them. They're all part of that one factor, right concentration. I mean, the relationship that he gives between mindfulness and concentration is that the four factors of the four types of mindfulness, or the four objects of mindfulness, those are the themes of your concentration. It's not just the objects, it's a particular set of activities. You know, ardent, alert, mindful, focused on the body in and of itself, or feelings, or mind, or mental qualities in and of themselves, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's the practice of mindfulness. And includes within it right effort, that quality of ardency, in which you generate desire, focus your intent, stay persistent in trying to prevent unskillful things from arising or abandoning unskillful things that have arisen, give rise to skillful qualities, and then maintain them once they have arisen. That's how right effort gets folded into right mindfulness. And then your ability to stay with that until the mind settles down. And it's able to abandon all unskillful mental qualities, all thoughts of sensuality. And sensuality here doesn't mean the objects of, of your desire. It means the actual desires themselves. You're focused on sensual desires. That's a problem in the mind. We really like fantasizing about sensual pleasures. And so if you're mindful enough to abandon that, then it allows the mind to go into stronger states of concentration, where you really do stay focused just on the topic of your object of mindfulness, the activity of mindfulness. Say you focused on the breath, working with the breath in various ways to make it a good place to stay. Then you get really absorbed in that. This takes you all the way through the different levels of jhana. Those are the factors of the path. 
That's basically the main framework for what we're doing here. And so you want to look at your life. To what extent is it actually on the path, and to what extent are you allowing it to wander off? What qualities need to be developed? What qualities need to be abandoned? This, the Buddha said, is part of what he calls the customs of the noble ones, or the kind of the values of the noble ones, is that you learn how to delight in abandoning whatever you have to abandon and in delight in developing whatever needs to be developed. And the path does involve a fair amount of abandoning. The right resolve involves abandoning right speech, right action, right livelihood. Right effort involves abandoning unskillful things. Right mindfulness involves abandoning greed and distress with reference to the world. And things you develop tend to be right view and right concentration. Whatever skillful qualities you can man manage, particularly the ones around where you're causing stress and suffering. All too often we're thinking about other things, have other issues. And that right there is ignorance. When the Buddha talks about ignorance, it's not that you just don't know things, that you know things, you're looking at them in the wrong way. And because you're looking at them in the wrong way, they make you do the wrong things. You've got to develop the Buddha's sense of priorities. The big problem in life is that you're causing suffering, even though you don't want to. And all too often you're causing suffering in areas that you would rather deny. That's why the quality of honesty and truthfulness is so important, that you actually look at your actual actions and you look at the actual results. And you learn to be sensitive. What kind of stress are you creating? This is one of the reasons why we try to get the mind into concentration, is so that your sensitivity as to what counts as stress gets heightened. And the things you just accepted as normal before, you begin to realize this really is a burden on the mind. That's sensing that burden and sensing that it's not necessary. That's how you begin to gain some freedom. The Buddha once said that of the factors of the path, the right concentration is the main one and the others are its accessories. This is the one we have to work the most to get the mind to stay with its one object. To learn not only the technique of how to do this, but also having the sense of values that remind you this really is important. Because without the skill, you miss everything else. You can know about the, all the other factors of the path. I was reading a book recently by a professor of Buddhist studies, and it was amazing. Here was someone who had given his whole life to studying the Pali Canon. And the whole thing was very wrong-headed. He could quote all the passages, but he just totally missed the point. So it's not just a matter of knowing the factors. The Buddha talks about the different levels of discernment. There's the discernment that comes from listening or reading, and the discernment that comes from thinking things through. And although it's important to have those levels of discernment, the really important one is the discernment that comes from actually developing skillful qualities in the mind. That's when you get hands-on practice. And the teachings really do work on your mind. As you work on the factors of the path, they do their work on your mind. The mind becomes more sensitive, more alert to what it's doing. More open to the possibility that the suffering that you're experiencing in life is not something you want to blame on other people or blame on 
conditions beyond your control. The essential suffering that's weighing down the mind is something that you have been doing or something you've been creating through your own actions, and you can learn how to stop. Because that's what abandoning means, is you realize that there's something you've been doing over and over again, and you don't have to do it. And the way to get yourself not to do it is to see that this, it really is not worth doing. Whatever pleasure you get out of it is nothing compared to the pain that you're causing. You have to see that in action before you're really going to be able to drop that particular habit. And often the habits that we have to drop are the ones that we really, really like. And it's only by getting the mind a lot more sensitive that you're going to see through that liking. See through the blindness and the ignorance that underlies it. So you'd be willing to let it go. So this is why we're sitting here with our eyes closed, focused on the breath. We're not off reading through the texts and trying to learn all we can about what the texts have to say. We're here looking at our own breath to see what our actions have to say, viewed from the point of a mind that is centered, still, clear, stable here in the present moment that develops a more refined sense of where they're suffering, where it's coming from. So that once it really sees where it comes from, it can let go, it can stop. You develop a sense of disenchantment and dispassion for the things that you used to feel enchanted and passionate about. And when you have no more passion for them, you, they stop, and then their results stop as well. The things that used to weigh down the mind all go away. As the Buddha said, at that point they don't even leave a trace. They may have been weighing down your mind for who knows how long. But when they're gone, they don't leave any scars, they don't leave any marks. It's something that you've been doing this to yourself over and over and over again. And you suddenly realize that you can stop and you would prefer to stop. And that's it. The mind is freed. It's that freedom that the Buddha is aiming his teachings at. Everything else is a means in that direction. So try to make sure that you use the teachings for their intended purpose. That way you get the most out of them, and you fulfill the Buddha's intentions in teaching them to begin with. There's that passage in, toward the end of his life, the devas were worshipping him with flowers and incense and song. And the Buddha mentioned that this is not the way that you really pay respect to the Buddha. You pay respect to the Buddha by practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma, which means that you learn how to look at sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations for the purpose of giving rise to disenchantment. You look at, for, you look at their inconstancy, you look at the stress that they involve, and you learn to see them as not self. That, he said, is how you pay true respect to the Buddha. Now, what does that have to do with the Eightfold Path? What does that have to do with the Four Noble Truths? It's the way that you normally take the material that comes from your senses and turn it into suffering. That's the problem. You use the Eightfold Path to learn how to look into those processes. how you fashion the raw material from your senses into suffering, and how you can learn how to undo those habits.
because we cling to these things, so we have to learn how to develop this passion for them. So the factors of the path are essential for that, in particular the factor of right concentration. So the mind is steady enough and still enough and sensitive enough so it can see what's happening. So put a lot of work into the concentration. Many people want to say, well, how much concentration can I get away with? How little do I have to put into it? And the answer is put as much into it as you can. Because it's the right concentration that puts the mind in a position where it can really see. And it's from that position that it can use the other factors of the path. So they all come together. And you gain the release that the Buddha intended for you. After all, this is why the Buddha put so much effort into his quest for awakening. Not so that Davis would serenade him with songs and throw down flowers and throw down incense. He wanted to find the skill that put an end to suffering. He wanted to be able to share it with other people in such a way that other people would actually feel inspired to put it to use and gain the results. That was what inspired him through all those aeons. And so try to use that thought to inspire yourself as well.